I am hitting the record button. Welcome to uh, Talking Trout, December 2020 edition. Um, I'm your host, Mike Coor. I'm the State Council Chair for Wisconsin Trout Unlimited. Um, I got my co-host, Clay Parmley, is here um, helping me this evening. And then uh, our special guest is uh, Chris Collier, who's TU's Great Lakes uh, Stream Restoration Manager. Um, Chris is based in uh, Northeast Wisconsin, um, and uh, he's got some, some really cool photos and stories to, to tell us about the importance of fish passage and, uh, and, and the, the importance of that to, to the health of our cold water fisheries. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Clay right now. He's going to kind of run through some quick Zoom etiquette and uh, talk about our chat box, and then we'll get started. Clay? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, when it comes to using Zoom, uh, just a few minor things. Uh, the mute and stop video button are in the bottom left. Uh, if everyone could mute themselves and stop their video, uh, hopefully that makes our connection better and our audio quality higher. Um, if you have any questions for Chris tonight, uh, you can put them in the chat box, which is at the very center of the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I would ask that it stays mainly questions. Last week got a little cluttered. <laughs> um, that's really about it. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Chris. Who, Let's start his presentation. All right, thanks. Mike, can you give me a thumbs up if the screen share is working? Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm excited to kind of go through this uh, somewhat brief presentation, um, talking about Trout Unlimited's uh, work on aquatic organism passage, otherwise known as fish passage in, in northern Wisconsin. As uh, said, I'm the Great Lakes Stream Restoration Manager for, for TU National in the northern part of the state, mostly focused in the northeast part of the state, working in Lake Michigan watersheds, but also doing some work uh, looking at projects in our Lake Superior watershed as well. Um, We've done a lot of cool work up here, um, reconnecting over, uh, we're past 25 barriers removed now, reconnecting over uh, 100 miles of cold water habitat in Lake Michigan's watershed. So it's been a really successful program. Uh, Laura McFarland, I'm sure most of you know, started this and, and I've been fortunate enough to, to take the torch from her and, and keep moving with it. So without further ado, we'll have a little uh, presentation here. I'll have some time for questions and then more time at the end for a more in-depth discussion if people wanna chime in with questions or any of their thoughts. So starting with the basics, what is aquatic organism passage, also known as AOP? Um, the poster child are dams. The aquatic organism passage is the ability for fish and other aquatic species to move up and down a stream system and the poster child being dams as a common human impact that has cut off these connections. Um, this can be as simple as, um, or it, it can be, the, the impacts of this can be negative for a far number of, of, of different reasons, ranging from limiting access to spawning grounds, um, keeping species like trout from being able to access uh, cold headwater streams um, during the warmer southern, summer months, and the opposite of that, keeping fish that require um, warmer water temperatures from, from reaching the foraging grounds they need in winter months. Um, a note uh, important to throw out there about um, fish passage is it's not always a human-caused issue. Sometimes there's naturally occurring aquatic organism uh, passage concerns, which can be a good thing. Think about some of the native cutthroat trout populations in the West. A lot of them have only hung on with their pure genetic strains because of naturally existing aquatic organism passage. So not always a bad thing to have barriers in a stream. The big issue is when we start talking about uh, human caused uh, fish passage concerns. And like I was saying, dams are typically the poster child of that. But here in Wisconsin, while we have plenty of dams, there's actually a much more common human impact on our streams that is impacting aquatic organism passage. And that is our roads. Uh, we need rivers to be connected for fish, and it's up to our roads to facilitate that connection. Uh, a lot of what we see are roads with undersized culverts, and these culverts were designed using a hydraulic process or, or analysis method that really looked at 
what is the smallest structure we can put in the stream and still safely pass a base flow amount? So that's resulted in a lot of undersized culverts that might be set too high as well. And this creates high velocities and sometimes perched outlets uh, where the water comes out. And this can prevent species like brook trout from being able to access important streams. So a lot of implications there. What we've been seeing as we've seen increased uh, flooding uh, resulting from increased precipitation, like we saw, especially in the northwest part of the state in 2016 and, and 2018. This uh, photo on the left hand side of the screen being a photo from the Forest Service after one of those, the, the Father's Day flood event. Uh, we had a complete road failure. So not even just the implications to fish here, when we are looking at poorly managed road infrastructure, we're looking at a community safety concern as well. So there's a lot of implications here that have really emerged after what was thought to be a pretty a uh, simple way to manage uh, roads and streams has now developed into both a stream health issue and a community uh, safety concern. So just kind of diving into a little fun little demonstration here on, on aquatic organism passage. We're just going to have a pretty basic stream system here with a larger channel and some headwater streams. Uh, we go ahead and do some electrofishing surveys and find we've got three, let's just say brook trout populations in the stream. Everything's well and good. You've got good connection here. These populations, while distinct, can intermix and can access the various headwater and main stem habitats they need throughout the year for spawning, feeding, thermal refuge, et cetera. But let's say because, let's say this is where I'm working, it's in the Schwamigan Nicolay. We want some access roads for forestry and recreation. So we slap in some roads and some trails well, now we've got some road stream crossings and when our you know seasonal interns go out and do what is the Great Lakes road stream crossing inventory, they find that three of these crossings using that method qualify as a fish passage barrier. So now what we have is this cold water stream system with all the habitats required to uh, maintain a life cycle for a brook trout and has what are three healthy populations, it now shows us three populations that are either fragmented from each other or fragmented from headwater habitat. So I labeled the populations here so we can have a little talk. A and C are populations that are in the colder headwater areas. So it's not necessarily a concern for being able to get thermal refuge or maybe even spawning habitat. To have a meeting to get together. Talk. But these are probably going to be smaller uh, trout in size so they can't wow. access the bigger main stem channels. Um, then we look at B, it has access to that main channel, but can't access the extreme headwater um, channels. So there might be some concerns with uh, finding the appropriate habitat for successful spawning and natural recruitment, and also to withstand a, a really hot July and August. Um, those are pretty apparent concerns that, that are important to let those species, um, to let these populations access different areas. Another implication here is let's say there's some accident when uh, a logging crew's out there and a lot of sediment slumps into the, the stream that the population C is in and that sedimentation kills off the trout population. Because of this barrier, there's no guarantee that trout will be able to repopulate that stream. So there's a concern here too that if something happens to a population, whether it's um, some sort of uh, a virus or an incredibly, you know, you have a drought so the stream dries out or a sedimentation issue, et cetera, with barriers in place, it can be hard to ensure that trout can thrive there because there's no guarantee that a population could expand back into the region following some sort of disaster. So this is where I'll take my first break and, and ask any questions that have come up in this little introduction. Thanks, Chris. Um, I don't see any yet in the chat box, but uh, if anybody's got a question for Chris, just uh, type it into the chat box. You should see a button down at the bottom and hit, hit the chat and, uh, and we can get them, get them to Chris. I'm not seeing any right now, Chris, if you want to just keep going, I think, I think we're good. Keep going. Yeah. So I've been focusing a lot, obviously TU focuses a lot on the implications this has for trout populations, but looking at Wisconsin as a whole, this has implications going beyond our cold water system. So I want to touch on that and just kind of the, the larger scale impacts of how we've historically managed our road infrastructure and how TU is trying to work with our partners to influence a more proactive, uh, 
stream focused uh, management of our roads to infrastructure. And the first of those things is if you look at the fisheries of Wisconsin, you know, we've got an amazing diversity of fishes here going from, you know, tiny darters to, you know, lake sturgeon and paddlefish and just it's quite an astounding diversity for our cold water to our warm water habitats and everything in between. And when you look at those numbers, the majority of these species move during their life history, whether it's for spawning, for some sort of thermal refuge, or just, you know, as they move through a system looking for foraging habitat. Um, and a really cool thing I've, I've recently learned is that you can even look at species that are typically viewed as lake spawners, like uh, like whitefish, and since their numbers have been rebounding so much in Green Bay, they're actually finding that they, some anecdotal evidence from hundreds of years ago that showed uh, whitefish or claimed whitefish were spawning in rivers now that population is getting so high, whitefish are returning to rivers. So having, you know, having connection is vitally important for more than just brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, you know, the salmonids in, in our state. Um, it's for just a variety of game species. Um, another one, northern pike is a historically lazy swimmer, despite their fight when they're on a line. Um, so if they hit a, if they hit just even just a moderately poorly designed culvert, they'll turn around because they don't want to deal with it. So there's just a very large implication for this, um, for fisheries management as a whole. And it's not just the fish. Um, you know, a lot of our um, aquatic or semi-aquatic organisms, from salamanders to turtles to macro invertebrates, um, even some more terrestrial animals like mink and, and otter that can easily walk on land, do use, um, do go through stream, um, rose stream crossings. And if we manage them better and managing them better, I'll dive into a little bit more is actually designing a culvert to mimic a stream instead of just acting as a pipe to fit water through to be more of like a somewhat modified stream channel, but one that is doing its best to perform as naturally as possible. We've actually found some instances on the forest uh, where these were designed in such a way that there's actually banks on the inside that deer are starting to cross under the roads versus over them. So having, you know, these better designed crossings are benefiting a whole suite of species outside of fish. And then I mentioned it earlier, I want to talk about the community safety side of things. It's a big issue we're facing and where a lot of funding and support is coming from very various different um, realms outside of our typical um, out, outdoors angling um, ecology uh, focused funding initi initiatives and groups is because of the impacts we're seeing from flooding on our roads. Uh, you can just go on YouTube or Google and just quickly search, you know, road failure during flood and you can see you know four lane highways just liquefied during a flood event um, it's a little more common when you start talking about native surface and gravel roads we find in some more rural areas and up in the forest where we like to recreate um, but you can take an asphalt road and it can disappear in a couple minutes when a flood comes through and that typically happens because these pipes are designed or have been designed to pass a base flow level when you start talking about flood flows, which are increasing in intensity and frequency, you know, we're seeing it every year. Uh, it's more and more likely that the pipe is not gonna be able to pass that water and it's gonna go over the road. And when the water's over the road, it's all bets are off. You don't know what's going on underneath that water and it's a road manager's worst nightmare. Uh, we talk to them and they have their list of 10 crossings in their jurisdiction where they just go and slap up a road close sign because they just don't know what's happening there. Um, so it, it's a pretty big issue. So long story short there, the method that has been really pioneered by the Forest Service in Wisconsin um, uses a design method called stream simulation. And I think that kind of gives it a term where it looks more at the stream ecology side of things, but a really good way to think about it is resilient crossing designs. And that's because these are designed using methods that also take these flood flows into account. So they run these models, which admittedly aren't perfect, but give us a really good idea. And what we found is the way we design crossings to improve fish passage also allows uh, these crossings to pass underneath the road at least the 100 year flood. So not a perfect method, but we're taking what would, we'd see some of these crossings over top with a three, four, five year flood. And now we're fitting a 100 year flood through them. This one in the picture right here doesn't look like a giant crossing, 
but it actually failed two months before it was replaced. Thankfully, we had designs in place to replace it. And the model they ran showed this would pass over the like 500 year flood. It was just an astronomical number that was like, there's not a whole bunch of certainty of what that would actually look like. But the fact is this is designed to withstand a flood exponentially better than what was there previously. And when we design it for that, we're also decreasing maintenance costs because you don't need to go out there and clear out debris. Uh, every time that a tree falls down and washes into it. These are designed to pass the same, a similar size large woody debris that the stream and move at a normal condition. And that in turn increases the structure lifespan. So we've just got a whole series here of cost savings on top of just being a safer, a road that people can count on getting over during bad weather and also ensure that community is not gonna get cut off from important resources after some sort of natural disaster or some event. Um, I'll also throw out another note that the nightmare of a lot of road managers are when they have undersized pipes that create a nice little trickling sound and then the next thing you know the beaver move in and build a dam clogging it up and causing it to top over even if there's not a flood. These culverts are designed to not facilitate beaver activity at the inlet or outlet so even if a beaver starts building there a lot of times these culverts are mitered or cut from the top to the bottom so that if there's a beaver activity there's enough headspace that the flow will go over the dam or lodge being constructed so a lot of a lot of small victories here that really add up and make a healthier stream and just safer communities and, and a better use of of money when dealing with road maintenance. So I can pause there if any questions have come into before kind of diving into what TU has been doing. Yeah, Chris, we got a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one's related to dams and the, it comes from Kirk Stark. He asks, where we have dams now, are there plans for fish ladders? or other types of passage around them. Is that something that you've, you've encountered in your work in the Northeast? Um, not that I've encountered. Um, I do know that there are several dams up here that have fish ladders or some form of fish passage, some as intricate as um, I know on the uh, Menominee River around Marinette, one of the dams there, they actually have like, it's almost like a fish elevator where when it's like the sturgeon spawning season, they have fishery staff from the DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service out there actually bringing you know sturgeon and walleye and stuff up this essentially an elevator they load up and every so often this thing comes up and then they move the fish over the dam so they can reach their their spawning grounds um the dams i encounter are often remnant logging dams so we tend to just get funding together and go tear them out we did one on the north branch okano this year um ended up reconnecting over like a mile and a half of um, habitat in the town of wabino um, it really varies dam to dam who owns it what the community buy-in is um, and if the idea is, you know, fish ladder because it's actively used or just decommissioning and removing the dam. So there's a lot of options there. And it's, you know, a lot of times those those larger dam projects are largely community driven. And I'm sure Flodian members uh, on this call um, have been involved in some of those. Right. Um, we have one more question here. And uh, this is from David Fisher. He asked, um, what is the criteria to determine which stream crossing needs to be fixed? And I know you guys go out and, and your crew and your interns have, must have surveyed like thousands of these crossings. So how do you evaluate you know, each and every one and determine you know, where to spend the money first? That's a great question. Um, so we use a method called the Great Lakes Road Stream Crossing Inventory and it was designed by um, several different organizations across Wisconsin and Michigan primarily. Um, to go out and quickly assess road stream crossings to determine if they're fish passage barriers or not. We actually recently were a part of a, a team that updated it uh, just this past year to kind of include more of a flood risk component as well, but it's still the same thing, just with a few more boxes to check now. Um, and it can be used outside of the Great Lakes. I mean, it's applicable all, ac all across Wisconsin. The Great Lakes is just called that way because it was made by a group of Great Lakes partners. It's definitely applicable. and. And I can share information on all of that. And actually, I'm going to have there's going to be a little blurb about it in the next um, Wisconsin Trout uh, newspaper. So, uh, to get back to it, the criteria we really look at are flow velocity. So, we want to know how fast the water is coming out of the pipe. That's going to be an indicator of if it's going to inhibit fish movement through the pipe. Uh, we want to look at the length of the pipe because if it's so long, um, a lot of these pipes just have a sustained single flow through there that maybe it's not too fast to keep a fish from getting in but it's too fast for a fish to swim against it for, let's say 70 feet or something like that. Um, 
it also, it also takes into effect if there's any stream bed material in the in the culvert or not. If there is stream bed material, that often provides little flow refuges that you know they can take breaks behind that would naturally occur in in a stream. And that's how we design our new structures. A lot of older ones were just in such a way that either the flow velocity is so high that the stream bed material can't stay in it, or they're set too high that it can't get into it to establish some sort of um, flow refuges in there and, and actually some habitat in, in the culvert. And then the last or the two other big items, one is, is the outlet perched. So it would require a fish to jump into it and then swim up it. Um, that's a big red flag with, with, with a lot of our culverts. And the last one would be is the, the width of the culvert versus the width of the stream. So looking at how much the culvert constricts the stream, because if it makes a drastic difference, it creates um, some weird hydraulic conditions that tend to to keep fish from even you know messing with it. Do you guys also target certain specific watersheds? You say, okay, we're going to try to work on you know this specific watershed this year, or is it kind of piecemeal all over the place? Uh, it's it has started it as a piecemeal effort just to kind of find what's the worst offenders out there and let let's get some products on the ground to to see where this is working and what works best. But we've definitely become uh, more organized in our approach lately. Um, two years ago, uh, TU's uh, science team out in Boise developed a pilot um, Northeast Wisconsin Trout Restoration Decision Support Tool. Big long fancy name. Um, anybody's familiar with the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, they developed a kind of larger scale that this was modeled off and it breaks down um, watersheds into accessible trout habitat um, based on barriers, habitat quality, um, trout stream classifications, and then lists those different patches as you know, stronghold habitats or, or not strongholds. So we're now using that to help inform where we're focusing our efforts because if we see a stronghold habitat, we know that there are crossings in that habitat patch that probably haven't been evaluated because there's just so many out there. And we'll go focus on that to see, okay, where are the barriers in here so that we can secure this stronghold? Uh, and then we also just work with our partners, you know, Forest Service, County Forests, the DNR, uh, towns and counties and see, are there any crossings that are concerning you or watersheds you're really invested in? And, and, and go out and help inventory those. And we also work with the, the local TU chapters to, to hit priority watersheds of theirs as well. All right, one more quick question and then we'll let you continue with the presentation. This is from Tom Lager. He was asking if um, you could maybe um, provide a, a list of grant funding sources or maybe just name a few um, of the funding sources that you look to when you're considering like dam removal or a, a fish passage project within the Great Lakes watershed. Yeah, um, one we use a lot from the state is the, the DNR's uh, Surface Water Grants Program. They have a, a really good program of, uh, they just changed it up. Grants are typically due, the, the preliminary kind of first draft of a grant is due in late August, early September, and then the full grants due at either October or November. And they can provide somewhere between twenty five dollars and $50,000 to, to some of these projects. And then we tend to couple that with funding from groups like the Fish and Wildlife Service with their National Fish Passage Partnership and, and National Fish Habitat Partnership programs. Um, and then the Forest Service will bring in money on our partnership products we do with them. And then we also work with national groups like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They have a lot of brook trout focused fish passage initiatives that we you know, play a key role in getting on the ground. So those are just kind of some of the big highlights, there's always interesting pots of money. We're looking more and more at FEMA. They've developed new um, standards to their programs that are supposed to make them a little more accessible, but also focus more on um, the benefits from managing our stream crossings in more proactive ways like we've been doing with these fish passage designs. So that's a promising big chunk of money we're hoping to, to get some of our communities uh, working towards accessing. That sounds great. We're gonna um, I'm gonna let you continue with your presentation, and I'll keep uh, I'll keep logging the questions, and, and we'll come back to them. Okay. So now I want to jump into what what we're actually doing in Northern Wisconsin. Some examples of what Trout Unlimited is is doing by having me here. What am I actually doing here? Um, so I first want to look at just one of our priority watersheds in 
in the northeast part of the state is the Pestigo River. And this is one where there were just a lot of really important projects that the Forest Service when we started this work had lined up that they just didn't have the staff capacity or, or enough money to, because it wasn't a priority for, you know, annual road maintenance or for um, uh, any sort of future logging going on, which drives a lot of their priority road projects. Well, when TU put a position here, we were able to bring staff people and some money to the table to help get these, you know, off the plan sheets and onto the stream. So just kind of looking at this map here, the green lines were, were rivers or river reaches when we came in here that were already connected that fish get up and down. All the red dots with numbers next to them that you see are crossings that we worked on in partnership with the Forest Service or with landowners. And then the um, reddish pink lines going from them are the habitat reaches connected. So what you can see and what the big takeaway here is a lot of times you get in the main stem of big rivers like the Peshtigo and like the Rat and, and Otter Creek and in this watershed that are actually pretty well connected just because those are such big bodies of water. Um, they typically have bridges across them, which are less likely to cause a passage issue. But you hit these headwater streams that are important for sustaining um, these really healthy trout populations we have in the region. Um, they tend to have passability concerns. So you're really limiting your, pop, your, your population numbers by, by having these barriers in place. So a lot of this work is opening headwater habitat and then we do occasionally find the occasional, the occasional barrier on a larger river stretch that uh, just highlighting this number seven in the top left of the screen, that's on um, an Otter Creek. And just looking here, that opened over almost 20 miles of habitat. So a lot of this is opening really cold headwater spawning streams, but we're also finding areas where we can come in and, and open some significant chunks of, of really important high quality habitat as well. So. It can be as simple as some of these are less than a mile reconnected, but it's you know half a mile of really important headwater habitat, or it can be 20 miles of really important, you know, just to open that main stem up so that you know we can continue working in that watershed. So one project I want to highlight, um, Colburn Creek. This is in Forest County. Uh, shout out to the Wild Rivers chapter. They actually helped acquire one of those uh, DNR surface water grants. This was a really difficult project to get funded. It's a very interesting stream, some naturally occurring braided channels up and downstream. So a lot coming into and, and leaving the culvert um, probably wasn't the best place to put a road, but we find that a lot. Um, so we had this really complex system. What this photo doesn't show at the outlet is both pipes were, were perched and flow velocities were high enough that they were both in excess of four feet per second, which is way more than is needed through the inventory method I was talking about to create fish passage concerns. So then we came through, TU helped with surveying this crossing. Uh, we had TU chapter members out that helped actually inventory and identify it as a barrier. Then we had our team out to survey and design a new crossing with the Forest Service and then getting financial help from the Forest Service brought in money, TU National got funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and then the Wild Rivers chapter brought in money from Wisconsin DNR. We were able to put in a, a concrete structure like this that this is kind of getting near the top shelf of our culverts we picked from, but with a stream this complex, we needed something that was this stable and this large to be able to handle, handle the flows of the system. So I was just out there this past spring and ran that inventory method again, and it coded out as not a barrier. So this is a successful project. And I'll jump back here real quick. You can kind of see these constrained pipes are the perfect example of what I was saying, where they're set too high and the flows are so high that any mobilizing stream bed material was either not getting through or was getting flushed out. And if we look in there now, you can see that there is an actual stream bed and some small banks constructed in this that's just allowing the channel to act while it is a channelized section of the stream, it is acting more like the stream would naturally than it was before. So we're just trying to limit that modification we're putting on the system. Um, another project I wanna highlight, uh, this one was just on this near, this was the North Branch Beaver Creek near the, the state fishery area on that stretch of river. Um, Wisconsin DNR led this one. So the previous project I highlighted, TU took a leading role from that project from start to finish, from chapter involvement to getting funding on the ground to, to put it in was, TU was heavily involved in that. This was one where we played a different role. Uh, the DNR played 
an important role with this. Chip Long took the lead on this, the fishery biologist for this area. Um, and it was uh, interesting, you can see there's, there's four pipes here. Um, it had constant issues with overtopping and getting clogged up with debris. So there wasn't, there wasn't a huge fish passage concern. There was enough that, you know, there was concern about just enough movement to sustain a healthy population, to be able to reach the upstream spawning areas. But the big issue here was there was just constantly debris buildup and sedimentation upstream because just the flows were ponded up and it couldn't pass through. So what TU did is we came in and actually helped do the survey and design side of things, then kind of went hands off. The DNR took our design, um, which was designed using those methods to improve fish passage and flood resiliency. And they went out and got the funding to get this on the ground. And they just installed this structure this year, much better performing. And just to, cause there has to be a fish picture. I'll show, Laura was a part of this from the beginning. This was them surveying and the, they were pulling out, you know, I'll be here next year for the brook trout and brown trout they're pulling out. So if anybody wants to go there, just shoot me an email and we'll go out together. I know where it is. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was just a really cool one where it just showed that, you know, we don't have to expend all of our resources um, from start to finish, you know, staff time and money to implementation costs. We can come in and do a portion of the project. And it was the portion of the project the DNR did not have the staff expertise or time to do. So we came in were much cheaper than hiring a consulting firm. And we were able to get them the data they needed to go out and get the, the grants and the state allocated funding to show that this project was worthwhile. And now we've got a much better structure to encourage fish passage in the system. So I kind of touched on this one, so I won't stand in as long as I was going to, but a key thing what we do is planning and prioritization. And that is because we have this inventory method. We can go out and find out what's on the landscape. I bring on a seasonal team every year um, that every summer we go out and, you know, check out somewhere between 100 and 200 crossings, depending on what our workload's like. Um, and that just gives us an idea of what culverts are causing barriers, which are causing flood risks, which are causing both and which are performing fine. Um, this is also something that's very easy to learn and, and chapters, chapter members have helped us before with this. And if there's any interest in using this in the Great Lakes or other watersheds, let me know. Like I said, we've just recently updated it. Um, it's really cool now. It used to be going out with paper sheets and trying not to drop them in the stream as you were trying to jot notes on them. Now we partnered with Michigan DNR to run a basin-wide update of this protocol. And the Michigan DNR is actually hosting a, an ArcGIS website hub for this that in real time after data is uploaded shows all the stream crossings that have been inventoried across the basin. So it's a really cool tool now. You can download an app for free on your phone or a tablet and all you need is a GPS signal and you can run this. So it doesn't use your cell service or anything. It's a really cool tool. So if people wanna learn how to do this, it, I'm more than happy to take the time and, and head to chapter events or, or regional events to, to help train up in this, in this method and you can get out and try it out on the streams in your area. Um, so I kind of touched on it. The big reason we complete inventories is short and long-term planning. We identify fish passage barriers and flood resiliency concerns that are both immediate concerns where we have actually found crossings that are cracking and collapsing in the middle and water piping out the sides that are like, this needs to be fixed, you know, ASAP and, and a long-term fix needs to be thought of beyond it. What's more common though, is we find crossings that are in the process of um, degrading and, and performing um, in less than stellar ways. And then that way we can work with the road manager, you know, whether it's the forest service or forest county or a, a town in Marinette County, you know, anybody who is in charge of managing that road, we can then sit down and look at and say, these are the issues we found. And if they're interested in pursuing uh, solutions to this beyond just a lot of times what you see is they replace a structure with what was already there thinking, oh, I just needed a new one, when a lot of times it needs an actual updated, um, more substantial structure. We can talk about how TU can help there, and that's where I'll jump to my next example. In Northern Forest County, the town of Popple River, it's a town of 26 full-time residents. They don't have much of a tax base at all to pay for road maintenance, but they still came to us after one of our events we hosted, and their town chairman said, I have some culverts, I have, I have concerns about you can look at them. We went and looked at them and found that they had some culverts that were really backing up water here. You can, you can see in this that 
the water is significantly wider than the culverts are. You can see beaver debris on the right hand side of the photo that's been pulled out. They've got a lot of issues at this structure. And instead of just saying, I will wait for it to fail and put a new one in, they've come to TU and, and they have us actually designing crossings. We're, we're looking at some alternatives right now, working on a final design so that we can then help them get to a point where they can install that new crossing. So that's where we're coming in and just providing kind of that preliminary work where even if they decide they can't afford the new crossing right now, they have a design on the shelf. So if something does happen here or they do get, let's say a FEMA grant, they can slap those plans on the grant application on the table and say, this is what we want. This is what's gonna probably solve our problems. Another example of that is in Ocano County. We're working with the um, Wisconsin DNR, US Fish and Wildlife and the town of Brazo. Uh, this is a perched culvert on McDonald Creek. It's a class one trout stream. There's three miles of upstream habitat and this is the only barrier on the stream system. So we're working with the town to solve this issue. Um, and you know this culvert is surrounded by wetlands. So there's not a flood concern. So this is truly coming through as a fish passage concern. You have a perched outlet the culvert is four feet wide, the stream bank full is measured at 20 feet. So it's, the culvert is 25% of the width of the stream. So it's, uh, there, there, there's some issues there, um, but it's just a cool area. We've gone in, we just did the survey on this and we're gonna be working on designs this winter to, to put in a structure that's going to be set lower and wider to facilitate fish passage in this area. Big part of what I was talking about, and this photo is actually when the town of Popple River chairman was at an event with us and, and ended up reaching out to us, was we've started hosting tours and workshops. Uh, the tours happen in a typical year. Every spring, we take people out on a bus tour of about five to seven crossings, show them three or four that are examples of bad crossings, showing perched outlets, undersized, you know, poor alignment, just kind of a whole suite of what are common issues at culverts that create flood resiliency and fish passage concerns. And then we take them to two or three crossings that have been updated recently to address those concerns and show them, you know, these are examples of what we're looking at. And this is a perfect example one. It's a pretty low cost alternative that took a culvert that failed and replaced it with the structure. I actually showed this one earlier. It was the one that I said was modeled to pass a 500 year flood. Um, it was a, for the benefit received from this, it was an actual, um, a pretty big benefit. And this was with the town of Blackwell that actually was involved in this one as well. Um, and, and they're another very small community that recognized the importance of, of investing in this, both for the recreational economy of having anglers in the area be able to have healthy fish populations is key for that being in the heart of the Peshtigo watershed and a lot of really good fishery areas on the national forest but also just because they've got residents scattered throughout this area that if that road goes, they've got to drive five miles around to get somewhere, which isn't a ton, but if it's an emergency, that can make a difference to them. Uh, we then also host workshops that go a little more in depth. We talk about design methods um, and, and more, we take in-depth field trips to kind of teach them how to shoot surveys, how to do inventory methods, kind of go through the whole suite of activities that are involved with a hands-on approach. And then after that, we use those tours and workshops to make the connections to do inventory and prioritization work, whether it's giving more in-depth training to road crews or county conservation crews, or even going out and doing the inventories for them on some of these priority watersheds. So at that point, that's kind of the, the 10,000 foot view of everything we're doing with some with some up with some examples of the work we've done. And I'm happy to entertain questions, comments. Uh, anything you all have. Yeah, that was great, Chris. Appreciate you sharing all that with us. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in and I think you started to address one of the questions. He was kind of asking about sort of your long-term planning and uh, what type of goals you set. Um, do you guys have like a certain number of um, crossings that you try to um, fix every year, or is it a certain number of stream miles that you're trying to open up? Um, what's the goal? Yeah, we, we a typical work year is between seven and 10 crossings per year. Um, and that accounts for, you know, an average of one year, we might do 15 and the next we do three. Um, it depends on, you know, what work's been lined up, how the design process and all the permitting fund that goes with it went. But it averages seven to 10 crossings per year. 
And so far that's, that's gone out to somewhere between 15 and 30 miles a year, depending on, you know, where the focus is, how far up in the headwater streams versus closer to the main stem. Um, but yeah, seven to 10 crossings is a typical workload. Um, we might start seeing more of that. Um, some of what I didn't touch on is a lot of this work started with the Forest Service and the tour and workshop events we've been doing now are getting more out to, we're gonna continue working with the Forest Service, but that has become such a well-oiled machine, our partnership, that we are now diving into more work with towns and counties to provide some of these, especially in, in the more rural areas that don't have the staff or the funding, kind of that partner that that isn't, you know, that has the resources to come in and help them get things done a lot more cheaply than hiring consultants, which a lot of times is out of the question and, and navigate some complex funding opportunities. So I would not be surprised to see that seven to 10 number increase, uh, but seven to 10 has been the average so far. And it's, it's a pretty busy workload in the summer, especially with the construction stream uh, restrictions for trout streams in Wisconsin. But, you know, we've got plenty of work lined up. I was just on a call last week with the Forest Service. We've got, you know, three years of projects lined up with them with many more to come after that. So. That sounds great. Um, Jesse's got an interesting question that I'm sure will be of interest to a lot of people. Um, and we've been hearing a lot more about citizen science and, uh, and ways that anglers can get engaged in conservation. Um, he was wondering if, if there's an app for our phones or if we run across like one of these culverts that we think um, is causing an issue, is there like, how should we identify that and who should we get that information to? So in terms of just a basic, I have concerns about this and, and wanna have it further investigated. Um, there's not an app that I'm aware of yet, but I will follow up with our citizen science coordinator, Jake Lemon on that to make sure that I'm not forgetting something. Um, I would just drop a GPS point and email it to me and here's my contact info. Um, so feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have, whether it's dropping a GPS point or saying, hey, can you come out and take a look at this type of thing? Um, that sounds good. Oh, there, go yeah, there, there is also the app for the, the updated road stream cross inventory. Now that's, you know, once you get trained up, that inventory takes about a half an hour to run from start to finish. Um, it can be faster on smaller crossings. Um, but that is an option too, if people are interested in being trained on that because they want to be able to flip their phone open at what they think is a bad crossing and quickly run through it on a day when they're on the river. Um, that's something that, you know, like I said, it runs on a GPS signal. So I use it in the middle of the national forest with full leaf canopy in the summer and have very rarely had a point where I can't get a GPS signal. So it won't upload the data right away until you get a cell signal again, but you can do it on your phone. And that's something that if, as people get, if people are interested in getting trained in that, if you have the time and, and want to do it, it, it's an option and can be done with, it can be done to a point where we know if it's a problem or not without all the equipment it calls for. So it can be done with basically as simple as your phone and, you know, if you're out there, your rod can be your, your measuring stick. <laughs> Perfect. So a, a similar question here. So you got a, a gentleman who, who has identified a culvert on, on a creek that he thinks um, may be causing an issue. And he wants to know if there's a list or, or um, if, if there's a centralized database where you guys keep data um, that's already been identified as problematic and, and maybe somebody's already working on a solution to that. We are working on that. That has been the, the million dollar question everybody's been asking the past few years is why is not all this stream crossing data on a centralized database? And the interesting part of being in Wisconsin's Great Lakes watersheds is you're getting tugged two ways of where's the Wisconsin database and where's the Great Lakes database. Right now, the Michigan DNR is working on a Great Lakes database, and I will make a point to send you that publicly available site tomorrow, Mike, so you can share it. Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, that will highlight it... any survey data that's been done recently or has been sh historic data that has been shared with, the D with Michigan DNR. They've uploaded it for any state in the basin. Um, beyond that, it becomes more scattershot and can be, you know, um, emailed me to see if I know anybody that might be in that watershed, a watershed group that has it. But I know there are a couple groups, um, including Wisconsin DNR and a Wisconsin Coastal Management Group that are actively looking at developing a, an online resource to store all that data for Wisconsin. So hopefully in the next few years, there is something like that, if not shorter for Wisconsin, that's gonna just capture the entire state. 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, I have obviously don't work for the department or anything like that, but um, it never hurts to reach out to your local fisheries biologists either. Mm -hmm. They seem to be um, pretty well knowledgeable of, of what's going on in the area and the fisheries. So that's always an, an option there. Um, let me see here. Uh, somebody mentioned the TU Rivers app as a possibly being a resource that that anglers could use while they're out to, you know, shoot a picture and, um, you know, I think it it builds builds in the GPS coordinates and things like that as something that we could follow up with um, later on. But yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Somebody wanted to know how large that book trout was that Laura was holding. <laughs> I think uh, Chip Long measured that one at 14 inches, I think. Nice. And uh, they need to contact you to go find out where it lives, right? I know exactly where it is. <laughs> Perfect. There's bigger browns there too. So it, it's a fun, it's a fun day on that stretch of river. Yeah. Yeah, that's a sleeper stream for sure in Northeast mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we've seen, I'm seeing a lot of really nice comments, like interesting um, photographs that you presented. Um, I think there was a question about uh, some of the before and after, um, before and after inventories. Are you guys going back after you do the work and doing any type of studies to compare it to the, the, the way the stream was before? Yes, uh, we are currently developing a more robust monitoring program to make sure we're getting all the data we need. But at the very least, we've gone back to these sites and done a post-construction uh, inventory to make sure that you know we put this in to solve a fish passage concern. Let's see if this scores out as no longer a barrier. So at the very least, we do that. Um, we're also working on collecting more data there, be it temperature data, if there were some temperature concerns because of the structure or even just shooting a new survey to show that the stream is, you know, has been restored because of the, um, the new structure. So we're, we're collecting more and more data and we've actually gotten funding to where not in 2021, but in 22 and 23, we're gonna have a part of the summer, a crew over here doing some electro fishing and possible um, uh, eDNA work to see how this is impacting actual brook trout po or trout populations in general. So. We're developing a more robust monitoring presence every year. Yeah, interesting. Could you maybe just speak for a minute about the importance of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative? Yes, um, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative or GLRI has been just absolutely massive in any of this work in Wisconsin and in Michigan that we've been doing as part of our Great Lakes team. I mentioned the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation something like 95% of the funding that comes through their brook trout money in the Great Lakes through their Sustain Our Great Lakes program is GLRI allocations passed through the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there's also GLRI thrown in EPA grants. Some of our um, colleagues work with in state money through programs like the, the 319 program. Um, GLRI has its fingers on a lot of pots and without it, we would not be able to do a fraction of the work we're doing. It's just been a huge investment from uh, the federal government that has allowed us to unlock both state dollars, but you know, in, in, in my work recently, that investment and the work we've been able to do with it has unlocked a lot of, of private philanthropic dollars. You know, we have recently gotten two significant grants from foundations um, interested in improving Lake Michigan's watersheds because of the work we've been able to show with those initial GLRI investments. And another GLRI funding that doesn't come to us directly is the Forest Service gets a lot of GLRI money and they use that funding for their road stream crossing work. So they essentially match their GLRI with TU bringing in funding. So it, it, it's everywhere. And it's just been unlocking a lot of funding and it's really been, it's really been a great way for TU to show the organization that we are, that we take this money and invest it locally and and use it on projects that make a meaningful impact. Cool. Tom Logger's got another question for you. Um, he's wondering if there's a need for 
if there's any type of special training that you need to do for um, the contractors who are out doing this work, or if this is pretty standard operating procedure for them, do they know the drill or, or do they need to be um, kind of schooled in how to do work in and around the watershed? Fortunately, we've got several contractors in Northern Wisconsin that they've been doing this for a while and now we're just asking them to put bigger pipes in. So they know what they're doing and they've been doing a lot of it. Um, we still go out there and we keep an eye on it. The training that we've been talking about doing more of is more for the county road crews when they'll do their own projects just to make sure they know exactly what these new designs require you know, what to look for because it's different than just setting a four foot steel pipe if you're asking them to put in, you know, one of those concrete arches. Um, so we've been doing a lot more work with, with like the county and, and town construction crews, but the private contractors have been, we've got some great ones up here that are doing some awesome work and, and they've been really easy to work with. We go out just to make sure everything's being filed on the plan sheet, but they know what they're doing. So uh, somebody else had a question, and I know I, I think you talked about this earlier, but they were just wondering if you could, could go over again real briefly what the parameters are that you use to kind of classify an impacted crossing. Yeah, I'll kind of run through this a little more, um, hopefully with less words, I guess. Um, first one is we're looking at purged outlets. Is Does the water come out at the same level as the stream or is it dropping almost like a mini waterfall? Um, then we're looking at structure width and length, um, stream velocity, uh, the depth of water in the structure, and then if there's any stream bed material in the structure. Okay, got it. That's great. This was a uh, this was fascinating stuff. Um, that, can't thank you enough. I know Laura McFarland started the work years ago and uh, it's been great to, to see you pick up the ball and keep running with it. And you guys are doing really great work up there. And we can't thank you enough for, for the work that you do. Yeah, thanks. It's been a lot of fun. And, and one thing, you know, I don't say this just as a, you know, giving a nod to, to our, our members and everything, but I truly mean that a lot of this work would not be possible without the investment, both the volunteer hours and, and the contributions that our members give us. Um, that local grassroots support is what sets TU apart from other organizations and really what shows that we are an organization committed to making a meaningful local impact. So that's allowed us to do some really exceptional work at the national level and, and we know where it comes from in our organization and we're very appreciative for all the continued support from, from our members, chapters and council. Sounds great. Clay, got anything to add? Uh, we sign off? Uh, thank you again, Chris. Uh, fascinating stuff. That sounds great. Well, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I hope everybody stays safe over the holidays. We're going to be back with you in January. Uh, January 6th, I believe, will be the next Talking Trout episode. Um, We've got the head of TU service partnership. Um, Mike will be coming in and uh, giving us a presentation about that. Um, TU is, it, it was previously known as the veteran service partnership and, uh, and they've recently expanded it. And now it's just the service partnership and they, we work with veterans as well as first responders. So um, it should be a pretty interesting uh, presentation and we're looking forward to it. So. Everybody stay safe, enjoy the holidays, and we'll see you in the new year. Bye now.